Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Everybody here okay? Mm -hmm. So my name's Pat Harrigan. I'm Alexander House. I'm John Hammock. Uh, we, you might have seen on the listing, uh, we also had Brian Tawara listed as being on this panel, but unfortunately he is not able to attend the con. So uh, that's unfortunate. He was going to be kind of our poetry guy for the panel, but we shall soldier on. So uh, the way this is going to work is uh, I have kind of an opening overview lecture that will take maybe about 15 minutes. And then uh, Alexandra and John and I are going to have a more free-form discussion uh, where they're going to dial in on some other specific things. And then I have a few um, other little mini lectures if we have time for them uh, later on in the panel. So, and then hopefully we'll have time for a little short question and answer session. Okay, so. Thank you for coming to our panel on literary modernism. What is literary modernism, and why are we talking about it at Convergence? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. So what it is, roughly speaking, we're talking about a number of innovative, innovative movements in literature from the late 19th century to around World War II. That's kind of the time period we're going to cover today, although we'll drift a little further into the future. Uh, these are books like Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, Gertrude Stein's The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, John Dos Passos's USA Trilogy, James Joyce's Ulysses, Virginia Woolf's The Waves, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and so on. Now, in 1924, Virginia, Virginia Woolf wrote, quote, On or about December 1910, human nature changed. All human relations shifted, and with human relations change, there is at the same time a change in religion, conduct, politics, and literature. Now, Virginia Woolf was making kind of a joke there and being deliberately provocative by affixing such an exact date to when the world became modern, but she's not entirely kidding. Before this point, uh, when we're talking about European literature, and I'll get back to that in a little minute, in a minute but when, what we're doing is we're talking about realist literature in fiction, or romanticism in poetry. By the mid-20th century, we're drifting into what people call postmodernism. And so it isn't really easy to identify where something is mo it becomes modernist and where it isn't, because they kind of bleed into one another from both sides. But um, an additional caveat, we're only going to be talking about modernist literature today, but modernism was a movement in plenty other, uh, plenty of other areas. Painting, you can think of Picasso and Matisse and abstract expressionists like Jackson Pollock. Sculpture, Henry Moore, 12-tone music composers like Schoenberg and Webern, or Stravinsky with the Rite of Spring. Architecture with Frank Lloyd Wright. There's uh, modernist dance, and John will be talking a little bit about dance later on, I think. Okay. Perhaps. So, um, modernism isn't one thing, and one piece of modernist writing might not bear much resemblance to any other one, but they often share common characteristics and arise from much of the same background. So, uh, I want to apologize up front for what's going to be a sort of Eurocentric discussion today. Most of the writers we're talking about are white Europeans or Americans, although modernist literature also encompasses writers like Soseki Natsumi in Japan, African-American writers of the Harlem Renaissance, such as Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, Latin American writers like Ruben Dario. Uh, Alexandra will be talking a little bit about Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God later, but otherwise it's going to be a pretty light afternoon. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, we could, because I'm personally not competent to talk about those other writers, just don't know enough about them. So I don't want to speak outside of my lane. Also, the cultural positions of writers in Central America or Brazil, for example, are so distinct that they deserve to be treated with more specificity to their cultural milieu than the overall term modernism that we're going to talk about today. Um, now, there's some justification for this approach because in some ways modernism can be thought of as a purely local phenomenon centered around Paris's left bank, like just a couple of streets there, that had an outside, outsized effect on world literature. All right. So now that we know what we're not going to talk about, what are we going to talk about today? <laughs> um, so I want to suggest that what we call modernism was born out of the fact that the realities inhabited by the writers that we're talking about varied in fundamental ways from those of their parents and ancestors. This is what I mean. Here's a definition of modernism from Kevin Birmingham's book, The Most Dangerous Book, The Battle for James Joyce's Ulysses. 
Birmingham says, what we now call modernism was a loose collection of small cultural insurgencies driven by a broad, sometimes inchoate, discontent with Western civilization from the way poems were written to the way governments functioned and capital flowed. Suffragettes, suffragettes, anarchists, imagists, and socialists rarely formed tight bonds, but they were part of the same guerrilla band. And here's another definition from Stephen Mintz's article, How the Arts Shifted Leftward from Inside Higher Education in June of this year. It says, modernism, the challenge to established orthodoxies and older styles and forms in the artistic experimentation that acquired impetus from Freudian psychoanalysis, the rise of physics and the discovery of a hidden world of radioactivity, the invention of photography, new understandings of optics, the influence of non-European works of art, and the growing emphasis on imaginative fantasies, subjective emotions, the abstract, the unconscious, and streams of consciousness, was almost certainly the late 20th, late 19th, and early 20th century's greatest contribution to art and literature. Challenge to established orthodoxies and older styles and forms leading to artistic experimentation. So what sort of orthodoxies and older styles and forms are we talking about? So if you think of yourself from the perspective of a well-educated individual around the turn of the 20th century, what would you understand differently about the world than how your parents and grandfathers would have understood it? Because very little was as stable as it had been assumed to be 50 or 100 years earlier. If you were a religious Christian, even so, Christianity and the Catholic Church in particular at this point seemed less like a source of spiritual comfort and support and more like an oppressive medieval system with stupid ideas about science, art, sex, and progress of all sorts. The old uh, uh, colonial empires, the British Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Russian Empire were widely seen as ossified anachronisms out of touch with the modern world and the freedom of their individual subjects. By contrast, there was a powerful dynamism in places like Germany, which had recently been unified under Bismarck. This will prove to be kind of an issue for modernism later on, and we'll talk about that a little later. At this time, Marx is theorizing that human history and human behavior was directed by powerful economic forces. Darwin dissolved the distinction between human and animal and introduced the idea of deep evolutionary time. Freud suggested that the individual human subject was divided among themselves, full of unconscious desires and drives. Nietzsche suggested that even our most deeply held moral beliefs were the result of historical forces. And Einstein suggested that even space and time are not unchanging and universal. Now, after World War I, it's even more obvious that the old ways had led to disaster. Huge advances in technology, chemical weapons, tanks, airplanes had led to mass death. 15 to 20 million people died in the war, with more than that number wounded, and no family in Europe left untouched by tragedy. France lost 4.2% of its population. Germany lost 3.8%. Serbia lost 16% of its population in World War I. The Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, all of which had existed for centuries, were gone. There was a widespread sense that European civilization had reached a dead end. Ezra Pound, in a poem published in 1920, called Europe an old bitch gone in the teeth, a botched civilization. So, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a powerful indictment. So a friend of mine, who's a professor of English literature, supplied a handy little list uh, to me, because he knew I was doing this panel, of the things the modernists were rebelling against. They were rebelling against the tyranny of realism, of romanticism, of 19th century moralism of Victorian or European poetic diction and prose chronology, of the easy continuity of self and world, of the novelist as mere storyteller who presumes a common audience, of bourgeois views of art as a relief from life, of the view that language merely describes the world, of imperialism, of the incarnation of absolutes. But in the late 19th and early 20th century, reality changed. And there was a widespread sense that different forms of artistic representation and practice were needed to deal with that. So the result was a huge explosion of different styles, some of which shared enough common characteristics to get called a movement. Surrealism, Dada, Futurism, expression, Expressionism, Symbolism, Imagism, Vorticism, countless others. A lot of these don't bear a lot of resemblance to each other, but they meet the first criteria suggested by Ezra Pound who famously declared that the important thing was to make it new. 
All right, so what's the point? On what is your art grounded? So if you were an English court poet in the late 16th century, like Philip Sidney or an Edmund Spencer, you can make a pretty good living writing works that extol the virtues of Queen Elizabeth and the type of governmental, artistic, and cultural virtues that she embodied as the ruler of the British Empire. If you were a socially conscious French novelist of the 19th century, like Emile Zola or Victor Hugo, you might ground your work in the presentation of social problems and the uplifting of French Republican values. If you were a romantic poet like Keats or Wordsworth, you might view your poetry as expressing the meaning or sublimity of nature. But as we mentioned, none of these things had a lot of credibility by the time World War I finished up, so the modernists tended to view their art not as revealing or demonstrating meaning, as the romantic poets would have done, but as itself creating meaning. The art itself created the meaning. They could get quite evangelical about this. Many of them believe art to be a more important tool for societal transformation than politics or revolution. In some ways, I think that's one of the hardest barriers to really understanding the modernists. And not that their books are hard, because there's a lot of secondary critical literature that can help you with that, but it's hard from a 2022 content consumption mindset to really understand the idea that literature can somehow change the world. All right, so what are the techniques that the modernists use? Their main preoccupation, and I'm generalizing here, and I'm speaking primarily of James Joyce, because he's sort of representative of modernism, um, but this can be elaborated out to um, discuss, uh, discussion of other authors. The idea of how to present human consciousness through art is kind of central to their ideas. And there were a lot of techniques um, that they went about uh, doing that with. And what, I'll focus on one of the most important, which most people have kind of heard of, the stream of consciousness, because this is an idea that's entered into literature fairly, uh, fairly well over the last hundred years. So the dictionary definition of, it, of stream of consciousness is a literary style in which a character's thoughts, feelings, and reactions are depicted in a continuous flow, uninterrupted by an objective description or conventional dialogue. Entering another person's mind gives us a disjointed experience because we don't know all the hidden associations that propel thoughts to link together. Even in our own minds, we usually don't understand that. The modernists didn't invent, invent the stream of consciousness technique, but they really ran with it. And if we have time later on, I have some examples from different works of literature that we could, that we could go over. Uh, but, and I'll speed up here. I'm close to, close to being done. Other people can talk. But uh, there are other forms of experimentation. Think of absurdism, people like uh, Franz Kafka, nonlinearity, fragments, nonsense, subjective perspectives, symbolism, impressionism, and so on and so on and so on. A lot of these writers had a very um, precise focus on forms and systems. W.B. Yeats, for example, believed that history was a cycle, he called it a gyre, that would repeat on higher and higher levels. So history wasn't circular, but it would kind of go up like that. And it's almost impossible to understand some of Yeats's later poems if you don't understand that system. James Joyce's Ulysses is the quintessential example of creating a system or a new form. Uh, he wrote a novel that has 18 chapters, and each one of those chapters corresponds to a time of day between 8 a.m. and 2 a.m. An episode in Homer's Odyssey, an organ of the human body, a particular area of art or skill, such as theology, music, politics, or economics, a color, a symbol, and a different narrative technique for each episode. There are monologues, dialogues, catechisms. The Circe chapter is written as a sort of play with stage directions and so on. The Siren's chapter is written in a sort of musical fugue or canon. And in The Waves, Virginia Woolf intertwines the streams of consciousness of seven different characters over the course of many years of their lives in a sort of multi-part musical counterpoint set to the tempo of one day at the shoreline as the tides go in and out over the course of the day. And finally, before I turn it over to you, to you folks, I want to talk specifically about the difficulty of some of these books. Kevin Birmingham says, Something about James Joyce and Ulysses inspired irrational hostility. <laughs> I have found this to be true in my experience. I've met a lot of people who have tried to read Ulysses and they haven't gotten very far. And what's striking to me about it is that it's not that people find it hard or they find it boring, which is totally fair, but they're 
angry at the book. Like it shouldn't exist. A level of angry that James Joyce is an asshole for writing. That. It's always kind of confused me. Like I'm very well aware that there are things in the world that I don't understand, but I don't get mad at a calculus textbook because I can't understand it. You listen to a piece of music just once and somehow expect to understand all of its nuances. Yet we frequently somehow expect that fiction be completely transparent and approachable. So I want to suggest that the difficulty of some of these modernist novels and poems is much of the point. They're not meant to be consumed and then forgotten. They're meant to depict a complicated reality, and they provide a complicated reading experience. Some modernists were very aggressive about this. Their books were high art, not mass culture. They were only for discriminating audiences who were willing to put in the work. Kevin Birmingham again, quote, rather than writing a novel for a million readers, James Joyce said, he preferred to write novels that one person would read a million times. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then, uh, Birmingham's, uh, the final quote here before we do a wider discussion, Birmingham yeah. sums up this idea very well. He says, beauty is deeper than pleasure, and art is larger than beauty. So that's my kind of long-winded introduction. I was just going to comment on, so in my, my normal life, I'm a high school English teacher, and so I teach a lot of these subjects, and I think I was just struck by the, I'm teaching all the time, you know, you read something, it's meant to be re-read. You know, it's like you watch a movie a million times, you watch a TikTok video a million times, well, why not take the time with literature? And I think that's such an interesting thing that I think we're losing maybe in our modern day kind of sound white world. And so it just strikes me, I think, the more importance of the artist and how modernists brought that forward, that it wasn't just, here is this simple poem. No, I want you to struggle with it. I want you to read it again and again. Because I totally understand when I picked up, you know, you're like, got to read Ulysses, right? It's the best book ever written. And then someone will start it. Because I read it, and I, I know people will come to me and go, this thing, how? You know? And it seems like this monumental task. And I think it's something maybe we're, losing a bit in our modern times that I personally would like to get back to um, and uh, take the time that it's about this, I do think literature can change the world, but it can't just be a one and done sort of thing. I think a lot of the resistance uh, comes from a perception that it's maybe kind of anti-democratic in some ways, mm -hmm. to be difficult, like, mm -hmm. I, and, and maybe it is, you know, but uh, Resistance is, is clearly there. I mean, these people are writing difficult books. They're intended to be hard. Uh, you're not expected to understand everything, particularly the first time through. Um, but some of that generates anger. <laughs> yeah. Well, and anger is a byproduct of frustration, right? Yeah. Is yeah. Well, I was just thinking about the way that anger is a byproduct of frustration. Um, and the notion of rereading. You know, I've heard this notion that we should reread any book every 10 years because it means things to us upon each rereading. Um, uh, my mother in Los Angeles was briefly part of a discussion group of Finnegan's Wake, and the discussion group of Finnegan's Wake would read one page every month and just discuss that one page. And they never finished the book, but that wasn't actually the point. The point was about the deep delve of meaning that could be unearthed from every single page of that, that material, uh, in part because the associations are, in many ways, very deep, very profound, but also um, completely opaque on a first read. So when you understand that Joyce was referencing this particular river, this particular person, this someone from his history, or, or the overall mental structures that he was kind of bringing to the work and not making transparent through the work, um, that there's quite a lot to discuss. And I think on some level this holds true with any author and their work. Um, but the modernists really made that readily apparent that that was actually sort of an intrinsic part of the writing experience. So John, you're mostly a drama guy. Yeah, I am. I, uh, I didn't cover drama in my introduction. You didn't. Um, yeah, so um, I am uh, trained as a playwright and uh, have a lot of knowledge of theater history, which is kind of how I approached and first began to understand modernism. Um, also through forms of dance. Um, so thinking about the drama of the 19th century, which modernism grew out of, 
Um, I think it's worth talking about basically there were two main types of drama that existed um, pretty much throughout the Western canon at the time. And it was uh, either, uh, well, three really. There were classics, um, which were uh, usually the works of Shakespeare um, or other people from the 16th century and 17th century. Um, and those had a long history, uh, but even they sort of fell into two different groups of drama. And they were um, basically uh, melodrama, high, high tragedy, high emotions, high energy, over, overwrought stories usually of kings and queens and uh, major, major figures of history or pivotal figures. Um, and then there was comedies, and the comedies that they had were, were largely built on um, uh, happenstance, circumstance, luck. Uh, uh, you know, even the, the comedies of um, uh, Sardou uh, was, was notable for this because he was a French author of the 19th century, and all of his comedies turned on unlikely turns of events. Uh, there would just be one after another, after another, after another, and even Oscar Wilde's works have a little of this in them. Um, but uh, basically, modernism grew out of two parallel movements that happened in the 19th century, the late 19th century. Um, and those were social realism through the hands of uh, Ibsen, most notably, who dealt with uh, common people's lives and the sort of social turn of fates that they suffered. And then also Anton uh, uh, Chekhov, um, who himself was sort of a romantic and sort of had this sort of sentimental streak that came from melodrama, but really his works turned around in the hands of his director, Konstantin Stanislavski, who applied a very observed reality approach to them and made them into much more social realism than they were perhaps even intended by Chekhov to be inter interpreted as. Um, We'll talk more about Stanislavski in a minute. Um, I want to talk about Ibsen for a second. Um, so Ibsen wrote plays about, uh, he was, uh, where was he? He was a Norwegian playwright, um, and actually uh, didn't write really much of anything until he moved to Italy uh, to nurture his wife's failing health. Um, and when he was there, he was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, Italy is wonderful. And so he started, as many authors do, writing about his homeland and the problems that it faced. Um, I think there's a common thread of this in modernism in the expat communities all throughout the world. Um, and he started writing all these, these plays about uh, social issues. The notable Doll's House is probably the one that most people have read. Had a Gobbler also um, are kind of uh, held up right now as sort of early pseudo-feminist works. Um, I think one could view them through that lens pretty easily, and that tends to be why they continue to be staged. But his probably most notable works early on were um, Ghosts, which was actually about venereal disease uh, and a kind of um, uh, discredited theory of medicine that goes with it, um, basically that the sins of the parents could be transferred to the children. Um, and this was notable because it caused riots in the theater. Um, people did not like this at all. What a horrible topic for a play. This is not why we go to the theater at all. Of course, the theater was the notable form of entertainment in those days. Um, you didn't have movies. Uh, you had music. But if you wanted to hear stories, you'd go to the theater, and you'd kind of just go with whatever was happening. So people would go see, oh, this new play. That sounds cool. And be horrified by what was happening there. Um, uh, because of how relevant, how meaningful, how urgently it applied to things in their life that they themselves might know but not want to discuss. Um, Chekhov also kind of delves into that a little bit, but to a lesser extent. Um, but then there's the other thread that was kind of going in continental Europe, in Italy and France and Switzerland, um, which was the thread of absurdism, um, which is also the main branch of modernist uh, drama. Uh, this was sort of pioneered by um, Alfred Jarry, who first wrote his play King Ubu, which was about uh, embracing the grotesquerie and the political machinations. It's sort of a Richard III story about the grossest person in history taking control of everyone around him. Um, and, uh, and that was followed by uh, other works like Guillaume de Abonnier's, uh The Tits of Tiresias, which is uh, an incredibly strange play about um, the poet uh, Tiresias who had lived as a man and a woman, and uh, uh, it's just a surreal um, series of events that are also highly commented on, notably, uh, by the 
by a character of the director speaking within the context of the play. So it's it's not only nonlinear, but it also, uh, or it's not only absurd, but it also comments upon itself consistently. Ubu does this too. Um, and then there's uh, the works notably in Zurich, um, which was also a hotbed of uh, modernism, of uh, Tristan Zara and Jean Arp, who created the Dadaist movement. Um, they were also believers in automatic writing techniques, also believers in performance. They ran a cabaret out of a place called the Mayurai Bar, um, where they did uh, highly surreal, strange performance pieces that we would almost associated with a, a, like a cafe scene in uh, Greenwich Village in the 60s, you know, that sort of like weird, surreal poetry um, and very, very pointed costumes. Um, they were operating in the, in the 19 teens and uh, Zurich is notable for being one of the places that had not yet uh, or, or was untouched by World War I. So it became a place that a lot of people fled from other places on the continent in order to do work and still stay relatively untouched by the war that was ravaging the world all around them. Um, from, uh, from Dadaism, uh, and I could talk about Dadaism for so long, from Dadaism came uh, Pirandello and Futurism. Um, and the Futurist Manifesto is really fascinating. It uh, is basically this notion of progress at all costs. Um, and so it became a very hand-in-hand -hand thing with fascism, actually, pretty quickly, um, who also were big fans of progress at all, literally all the costs. Um, meanwhile, in France, uh, there was a development uh, following on the threads of Jarry and of Apollinaire of um, a, a form of theater pioneered by Antoine Artaud, who called it the theater of cruelty. Um, his most notable work was actually a short play originally by Lord Byron, of all people, called Spurt of Blood, which uh, he booked a theater for, and it too provoked riots. Um, I think it was shut down after nearly one performance. And this is, bear in mind, this is also in France, which was notable for having already had uh, a theater of grotesquerie called the Grand Guignol. Um, so violence and strange, surreal horribleness was not unexpected in the theaters of France, but this sort of new approach to really just making the audience deeply aware of the theatrical event that they're having and very, very painfully uncomfortable. Um, I guess you would call it cringe by now, by today's standards. Um, uh, Antoine Nartot wrote quite a lot about his theories. Um, he also was uh, eventually declared um, mentally unfit and put in an asylum. Probably not for his theories, but, um, but one does wonder a little bit how much the uh, parallel view of reality that one can have when having a mental breakdown might have contributed to his theories about what drama is. Um, a fascinating figure. Um, Anyway, uh, the social realism thread kind of continued, not so much in the continent, though there were threads of this in the works of Frank Bedekin, who wrote Spring Awakening and the Lulu plays in Germany. Um, and uh, it kind of picked up in Germany through through Bedekin, through um, Gerhard Buchner, who wrote a uh, notable play, Wojtzeck. Wojtzeck is really fascinating. Um, it's Buchner wrote a number of plays, but, but Wojtzeck is really compelling because he didn't finish it. He actually uh, died before it was completed. He never numbered any of the scenes, um, and it, the play doesn't actually have an ending. And yet, because of this, maybe, it's been hailed as a modernist classic because it doesn't have a formalist structure. One can break the structure into whatever forms one wants. Um, and you can totally reorder the play and derive different meanings from it. So I think in some ways it's almost accidental that it's a modernist classic. Um, fascinating the way the, the work goes into creating, or the, the way the author experience, again, um, translates into the way the work is interpreted. Um, following in Germany was uh, Bertolt Brecht, who uh, sort of operated in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, some of his works were uh, uh, borrowed from other historical uh, sources. Um, the notable Three Penny Opera was, came from a British source in the 1800s, or 1700s, 1720 um, Beggar's Opera. Um, 
Brecht worked with a composer um, who's Kurt Vile, thank you. Um, uh, who and and they have a they have a strong cabaret influence style. Um, so they they borrowed from heavily from the musical theater of their day and their trends. And Brecht uh, took the sort of social realism that was pioneered by Ibsen. And what he did was he sort of injected uh, that social commentary or pay attention to this uh, sensibility of the French. Um, and for what he uh, for a structure that he called Verfremdung's effect, which basically means alienation effect, um, or unfamiliarizing. Um, and it's basically taking a, a situation that the characters find themselves put in, and then using Kurt Weill's music, or using uh, social commentary, or using direct address to the audience to sort of pause the action and make you pay attention to the choices of the characters and what they're doing. And make you question in yourself whether you agree with this choice or whether you disagree with this choice. Uh, very often, the work is meant to provoke a sense of disagreement with you, much like the way um, uh, Ulysses creates this discomfort in the audience. Brecht is seeking to look at that discomfort and say, "Well, what would what would you do in this circumstance?" And it's no surprise that he existed sort of within the interwar periods where everyone had been forced to make these complex. Moral, moral equivalency choices um, and sort of weigh how they felt about the decisions that they made, their neighbors made, other people made. A real thread through his work is when someone does something horrible, how do we, uh, how do we as a society learn to live with them or the horrible things that they've done? Can we accept that? Can, do we have to reject them? What is the nature of those choices? And um, can you yourself claim to be exempt from that sort of thinking? Um, no, the answer is no. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go into Stanislavski. Um, Stanislavski uh, took this thread of realism. What Stanislavski was doing at the time was not so much trying to dictate what uh, he thought good acting should be. What he was actually doing was descriptive work. He went to the works of many different opera singers, ballet artists, actors. He was heavily influenced by seeing Sarah Bernhardt perform. And what he would do is he, he wrote down for himself everything he thought made good performance good. And so in trying to decipher what made good performance good, he sort of came up with these basic principles about how one should approach uh, text, subtext, intention. Um, he was also deeply influenced by the psychologists of his time, notably um, uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, and their sort of approach to the, the subconscious approach to character. Now, um, Stanislavski didn't seek as the French and uh, the Surrealists did to make the subconscious palpable, but what he did was he looked to how do we create those subconscious threads through the work itself and thread those into realism, and found in the works of Chekhov this sort of perfect uh, manifestation of that. Now, Stanislavski's work grew greatly in popularity in Russia um, until the revolution, and that's a whole other story. But um, his work was translated by someone named Boleslavsky, who brought it to the United States, where it took off like wildfire, um, and influenced a number of playwrights, notably um, uh, Eugene O'Neill was a little before this, but, uh, but Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller um, drew heavily from Stanislavski's approach um, and took those threads of literary modernism, social realism, and wove them into what we consider American art. Now, on top of that, almost all of the uh, active creators of modernist works that were operating in Germany and France in the 1930s, um, many of them moved to the United States, emigrated to the United States, and this was especially true of the film industry, which we're not even talking about today, um, came to the U.S. in order to create work because of those pesky futurists, the, um, the fascisms. Uh, and so um, modernism in the United States uh, through drama really flourished with um, more surrealist influences in film, which found its way into things like film noir and things like um, fantasy and science fiction, and, uh, and drama on stage, which uh, really flourished in social realism. Um, and that highly influenced the, the structure of our works. 
um, and all of our literary efforts. Um, melodrama took a huge back seat, as did uh, these kind of frothy comedies, and everything was focused much more on um, this sort of Stanislavskian acting method, which uh, kind of ate up both film and stage. Um, but moving alongside that, there were also non-literary movements, um, modern dance has promised. Uh, sort of, um, Isadora Duncan in the 19 teens and 20s uh, was sort of the first person to be credited with taking off the ballet slippers and dancing barefoot. Um, and her Isadorables, as they were called, uh, created a modern dance wave that influenced a great number of other dancers um, and sort of took down the, the hierarchy of um, formalist ballet and broke down dance to be uh, much more um, emotional, much more visceral, much more built around those sort of hidden psychological truths. Um, they would often use mythic influences in order to explore these ideas. And uh, Martha Graham is one of the notable people who sort of picked that up. Um, her dance is beautiful, um, very flowing, but also famed for its um, contractions that she would close in upon herself. And so this, this element of the grotesque also sort of permeates her art. Um, she has strong mythic components. Um, in ballet, there is a, a decompression or a, a, uh, a defocusing on, um, on the formalist structures that we might associate with, say, Tchaikovsky or the French ballet. Uh, the ballet Russe in 19 teens made their way from Russia to uh, Paris. Um, where they commissioned costumes uh, by Picasso and really broke down the notion of what ballet could be in terms of narrative forms or structure. It became about pure dance more than it became about trying to use it to tell dramatic stories, um, separating it kind of thoroughly from the um, Swan Lake sort of approach or the Nutcracker kind of approach of having a, a through line or a narrative element. Um, this got picked up even more so uh, in New York City in the works of um, George Balanchine, who was essentially a surrealist or uh, within the context of dance and really used ballet in sort of a pure form of just exploring human body and uh, the way that it interacted with the space, the audience, other human bodies. Um, Dance continues to go on into much more strange and surreal directions through the 1960s. I'm going to jump back over real quick to uh, Paris to talk about um, our good old friend Samuel Beckett, who probably everyone knows as the surrealist of uh, drama. Now, um, Samuel Beckett uh, sort of took this thread of social realism and the thread of modern or uh, of absurdism and sort of wove them together by having his characters be very grounded in their own reality. Um, super grounded in the subtext and context of why they're there and what they're thinking about. His characters are highly cerebral, really um, focused on their own experience and the subjective nature of their own experience. And yet the world around them it is, it, his stage directions create absurdity strangeness, complete unfamiliarity with the landscape or the conditions in which these characters are existing. We have this hint that maybe they came from some sort of realism that we ourselves find familiar, but their scenario is uh, absurd in the highest degree. Two people in the middle of a field of nothing, uh, a woman being buried up to her neck in garbage, uh, people living in garbage cans. Uh, his works uh, have no sense of a grounded reality within themselves, but they are pure psychological sort of uh, explorations. Um, out of his works, uh, sort of we get um, in the British thread this Harold Pinter's work, which focuses much more on, again, realism, but elliptical narrative, sort of the focus that uh, there is no center to his drama. We spend the entire drama trying to figure out what people in them are get going for, why they're trying to do what they're trying to do. They're sort of mysteries, but they're much more focused on the uncertainty of the connections that people are forming. Um, and then through Pinter, we get, uh, uh, Finally, to people, I mean, there are many uh, other examples, but we finally get to people like Tom Stoppard, who take these sorts of works, comment on them. Um, Rosa Pagans and Guildenstern Are Dead was his seminal work. It was at the National Theater in the late 1960s. Um, and it's basically a commentary on Beckett, um, but doing it through the lens of Shakespeare. And uh, his works are sort of give way to this sort of high structuralism approach that became much more common in the uh, Britain and American 
tropes of playwriting. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, modernism in the United States, at least, was sort of ended by McCarthyism in the 1950s, and uh, that many of the practitioners of modernism uh, in various forms, film, stage, novelists, um, were sort of forced to, if not renounce it, at least uh, sort of address what their works meant and why they wrote them. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the political side yeah, of things. Yeah, great. But that's like a broad overview of the stage and modernism on the stage. Thanks, John. Yeah. Well, let's hear a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah. And I have a quick little audience game. I yeah, exactly. I want to hear the audience. <laughs> well, I want you to do the audience game. So I wanted to talk a bit about Zora Neale Hurston and um, I'll talk more about Judah Barnes later, but I think one thing that strikes me with Hurston is, yes, yeah, very much a part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, one thing I think that I love about the modernist era is we have these different groups, these pockets of um, whether they're writers or poets kind of doing their own thing. Of course, we have the Bloomsbury group with Wolf. Um, we have our lost generation in Paris with our Hemingway, our Fitzgerald, our Stein. Um, and then we have our Harlem Renaissance. And to me, her student is always very much, she fits into that sort of mold, but to me, she's also not of it. Um, and some of that has to do with what I think are very much modernist aspects in her writing that are, of course, exemplified in probably her most well-known and most beautiful work, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, some interesting things that I always find with her student, she was very much at odds with a lot of um, the male writers in the Harlem Renaissance because she was coming from an extremely different background and um, political background as well. But I think some things about her that always struck me is, first of all, related to her background, she was primarily born, uh, she wasn't born, but raised in Eatonville, Florida, which was one of the only African-American incorporated cities in the entire United States at the time. And so she was growing up in a completely black African-American environment, whereas Hughes, Richard Wright, and others were having to deal with the power structures, obviously, of, of white society. And so I think that's one reason she, her writing was often at odds with some aspects of the Harlem Renaissance, which were, of course, the whole purpose, um, if we're talking about creating meaning, was to elevate the, the place, the position of the African-American community. And so you have Richard Wright writing Native Son, you have Langston Hughes, and then Person comes around and writes Their Eyes Were Watching God. And it, I think if you know anything about her, a lot of people know she fell into obscurity. Alice Walker actually wrote um, an essay about her in like the late 80s, which actually helped find her unmarked grave and really revive interest in her. And so for me, Hurston's modernist aspects are exemplified in this interesting take of having a more formal narrator, what we would call more formal English, which is a entirely different conversation of what constitutes formal. But um, whereas the dialogue of her characters, of course, is written in a dialect, the vernacular, um, and very much the vernacular of the folks she grew up with in Eatonville. So when this was published, you have um, folks like Richard Wright going, you are not elevating our people because you are putting on a minstrel show with this language. Whereas for Hurston, she viewed it as this, that was her reality, that was the beauty of the people around her. And so for me, she breaks a lot of those norms of, um, even I think the narrative structure of their eyes were watching God. Yes, it has a sort of dramatic structure, you know, you've got your kind of climax with the hurricane, if you're familiar with it. But yet, to me, it's doing some things that are very different from the writers who came before her. And as well as, she was doing it very differently than I would say white women writers were doing. Um, where Wolf, um, I think in ways because of her position and privilege, was able to do different things with her writing um, and be experimental. Or even Juna Barnes, who I think is interesting, the three women I have that we're kind of mentioning here were all um, um, female identified all have relationships with women and I think it's interesting that we have this you know books written about for example Nightwood Dylan Thomas actually called them it's I modern day we might take it a bit as a slight right because he said it was one of the three best books written by a woman <laughs> right not just written in general but 
you know, it wasn't popular. A lot of it had to do with, if you've ever read it, it is this very baroque sort of language. And I think one of the big things is just the sexuality. I mean, we have a lesbian triangle. We have a character who today we may see as non-binary, but I think back in the day they would have seen as, are they a cross-dresser? Are they, how are they identifying? So we can just imagine, you know, probably the, the majority of people were not going to necessarily accept um, Juna Barnes' lesbian writing, especially because she grew up in a polygamous family. She really came from a different background than, say, um, a lot of these these writers. And I think that's what kind of highlights, like, with, the, with Barnes or Hurston, they came from, like I said, very different background than Wolf or Elliot and some of these other folks. And to me, have their own distinct voices as, um, as women writers within this as well. And I think, like, I, getting back to the is the point I'm trying to make here. I just think Kirsten is really um, an important aspect of that as a different voice of the, the Harlem Renaissance, as well as, um, like I said, playing with with the the dialect, which I, when I, I, I teach this book, and that's probably the hardest thing for my students. You know, it's, it's a level of frustration and anger, like I don't know what they're saying. And part of it is we're in Minnesota. I think they just don't hear the Southern accent kind of in the language. but. They haven't necessarily, you know, if I think about books off the top of my head that contain, like, say, dialect and accents now, definitely I think more than there were, or, I mean, I can think of, um, a, like, a Mice and Men and all that, you know, Steinbeck uses it, but, you know, I think for Hurston to make these choices she made um, were really bold at the time, and to, you know, and to sort of stand up against sort of the male establishment, as it were. Um, and this is also why she was fascinated with Haiti as a country that had never been colonized. Um, and so she spent a lot of time there learning about the folklore of the country, bringing that back. Um, and so I, I just want to point her out, I think, as, as being a part of this, but maybe being overlooked. Uh, she's not as obvious as, say, a wolf for you know, some of our other folks. So. Mm -hmm. Another kind of undercurrent of modernism that we've touched on maybe a little bit, uh, and then I want to move on to something a little different, is a lot of it uh, was so focused on uh, sexual freedom mm -hmm. that it became that modernism, in particular from James Joyce, became extremely attracted to certain types of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Them, many lesbian women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Juna Barnes, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Joyce knocked her socks off. Yeah. It was just absolute like, uh, yeah. like seeing God or whatever. Mm -hmm. when she read Ulysses. Joyce's publishers in America of the Little Review, Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap were a couple. Uh, Joyce's publisher of, of Ulysses, Sylvia Beach, who founded Shakespeare and Company on Ferris's left yeah. bank, also a lesbian woman, and on and on and on. Gertrude oh, Stein, we have a lot, of, Stein, a lot of sexual freedom Virginia at this time. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we've talked a lot about uh, the kind of history and background of modernism, um, and so, but we haven't really given a whole lot of examples of what it is. So, um, if you want to stick around after our panel at three thirty, we're going to have an hour of selections of. Five o'clock. This is three. This is three. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. There's three of us. Five o'clock is. Three three is <laughs> we'll be here reading poetry and um, mm -hmm. excerpts from various things. But in the meantime, I wanted to talk. Wanted to do a little quiz for the yeah, audience, like if you don't mind. So I'm going to read the opening lines of three separate poems, one at a time. And if anybody can guess who they are from, well, we have no prizes, but maybe <laughs> you could guess who wrote it and about what year it was written. So if anybody uh, has a guess for this first one, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task, of pure ablution round the Earth's human shores. The guesses, to person staring at the sky. These are the poetic impressions. Oh, this one. What do you think, Jack? Yeah, there. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Keats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, uh, he has such a short writing career because he died so tragically. Yeah. Yeah. Something like 1812. Very good. That is John Keats it's from 1819. It's a poem called Bright Star. Yeah. And it is characteristic of romantic poetry extremely characteristic, mm -hmm. I would say. There's a very self-consciously old-fashioned, elevated language about it. People didn't talk that way in 1819, you know, this is in 
evoking Shakespeare. The diction is very complex, and there are some unusual words, Aramite, which means hermit. Uh, there's sacred imagery with priests and ablutions, etc. Uh, but once you decipher the meaning, the, uh, once you decipher the language, the meaning is relatively straightforward. I think you can you can kind of understand it once you break the code. All right, how about this one? I'll give you him. This one is translated from the French. Tonight the moon dreams in a deeper languidness, and like a beauty on her cushions, lies at rest. While drifting off to sleep, a tentative caress seeks with a gentle hand the contour of her breast. Yes, yes. The French one. It's, it's Charles Baudelaire from around 1857. Now, this is an ironic poem. It's seductive and languid. And the language is relatively clean and understandable, but there's a sexual component to it that is not there and keeps, keeps it ever. Well, how about this? Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants, the oyster shells. Yeah, that's it. I have this yeah. memorized. I love it. That's T.S. Eliot. Yeah. T.S. Eliot. That is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock from 1915. It's very colloquial language. You have modern technology in it, etherized upon a table. Quotidian details like the sawdust on a restaurant floor, the oyster shells. It's kind of sorted, talking about one night stands. The language is perfectly clear, but the meaning is pretty elusive. How exactly? Is an evening spread out against the sky like a patient thrust upon a table? What does that look like exactly? It's hard to know. This is a new reality for sure, but it's hard to get a handle on exactly what it is yet. It's going to come in 1915, right during the middle of the war. Mm -hmm. You know, I am I'm reminded just by the first set of those readings, you know, stemming from the 1820s and 1850s, which kind of predates the era that we are mostly talking about. But it gets me thinking uh, about, um, you know, there are there are many works that sort of presage a little bit the sort of threads of modernism. Um, you know, Melville's Moby Dick does this in a great way. Um, not specifically with form, or with the, with the language used, but with the structure. Um, it, is, it is just an extremely deconstructed novel um, with almost no through line at all, large epistolary sections, Large uh, dramatic sections, you know. There's sections just, about whaling. Sections yeah. about whaling, about myth, about uh, and the, and I think um, sort of one of one of the things that I was told about that particular book is that uh, Melville had actually just gotten glasses uh, right before he wrote it, and uh, and it was his exposure to the works of Shakespeare that made him go, oh, wait a minute, um, and I think this sort of the the notion of Kind of the lid blowing off of literature, um, not necessarily being uh, specific to uh, eyeglasses or Shakespeare, but this notion of people um, being exposed to new forms. You know, it's it's no surprise that um, the expat community in Paris uh, developed this work, that the expat community in Zurich did the same, that the expat community in Italy did the same, that there's uh, or or even that. That the work um, that moved over to the United States from Europe had elements of this. I, I think this notion of people sort of um, getting exposed to something new and unfamiliar uh, and having that experience of reframing their brain inform their work is a, a big part of what makes modernism what it is. Yeah, if people didn't wake up in 1910 and suddenly decide, oh, now we're going to experiment with fiction, people have been doing that. Centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence Stern had written Tristan Shandy in the oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, 18th century, yeah. that there was a, a universality to the idea. The idea that we could push, that we, we, we yeah. that yeah. they could yeah. push yeah. art yeah. further into the, into the future. And I want to, we have a few minutes left. I want to end this on kind of an unhappy note. <laughs> uh, politics? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So I want to, yeah. I think it's necessary yeah. to bring this up. Yeah. Um, Plus that. We haven't talked about the Anti-Semitism in some of the works too. 
Um, so I think, you know, by now the audience probably understands that I, I quite like the modernists. I appreciate the project, and I think some of it is the best literature that's ever been uh, created. But we do have to talk a little bit about the politics of it. So, because when you express such fundamental dissatisfaction with the modern world, there are a lot of different places you can wind up. But there's no particular reason why they have to be politically progressive in any way. That's for pound. Yeah, we'll yeah. But like <laughs> T.S. Eliot um, looked to the past for inspiration, and medieval Christianity became quite a conservative, he called himself an Anglo Catholic. John Dos Passos was a socialist as a young man, but uh, by the end was voting for Barry Goldwater and Richard Nixon. And uh, W.B. Yeats uh, expressed some pretty unpleasant pro fascist opinions and even wrote marching songs for the Irish Blue Shirts. I guess. Yikes. D. H. Lawrence, for example, like like Gates, had a pretty complicated view of the world, and he developed a sort of semi-pagan idea about the connection of human beings and the natural world, which he called blood consciousness. Which sounds a little too close to the phrase blood and soil for my particular liking. And and in fact, Lawrence's politics were very strange, a kind of mixed socialism and fascism, where his ideal world would have a unelected autocrat redistributing resources equally among people. Now, not everybody became right-wing. Hemingway was a lifelong socialist and anti-fascist. He was spied on extensively by J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, the Wolfs, Virginia and her husband Leonard, were what we probably call left liberals. Uh, Leonard, in particular, was associated with the British Labour Party and wrote articles for various left-wing magazines uh, against imperialism and advocating for universal suffrage. Uh, the German writer Thomas Mann, as a younger man, was a very conservative German nationalist, but World War I and the Weimar Republic kind of liberal, liberalized him, and then he was, of course, targeted specifically by the Nazis and had to flee the country. Uh, he eventually moved to Southern California to join that bunch of uh, German emigres there, uh, down on the Pacific Palisades, I hung out there with you know, Schoenberg and Theodore Adorno and Fritz Lang and those guys. And Mann became a fervent supporter of Franklin Roosevelt. Joyce was kind of an instinctual socialist, and then Ulysses was, he wasn't really, he was the, the furthest thing from a political or didactic writer, but I managed to, of course, piss everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Nazis hated Ulysses, the communists hated Ulysses. Uh, but the saddest example, and John mentioned this, is Ezra Pound. So Pound, for all his incredible importance, and he was enormously important, the only reason we know about James Joyce in the first place is probably because of Ezra Pound, who was his biggest supporter. Um, discovered him, really. Um, but Pound had always been an anti-Semite, uh, but in the 1930s he became a huge admirer of Mussolini. He wrote letters and articles supporting Mussolini, some of which contained some really appalling anti-Semitic ideas. Between 1941 and 1945 he gave hundreds of pro-fascist, pro-Nazi, and anti-Semitic radio broadcasts. At the end of the war he was captured by Italian partisans, put in a cage by the United States Army, interrogated by the FBI, and eventually charged with treason, although he was determined to be mentally unfit to stand trial and spent the next dozen or so years in a mental hospital before a letter writing campaign organized by Hemingway uh, and signed by a lot of other writers finally got him released. So if any of you have ever read Kurt Vonnegut's novel Mother Night or seen the film with Nick Nolte, that's a highly fictionalized version of Ezra Pound's story. Uh, and even stranger, modernist literature became a kind of battleground in the Cold War in the 20th century, too. By the late 1940s and 1950s, a lot of these guys, they're mostly guys, but a lot of these writers are used to be kind of disreputable, but they're quite respectable by them, and they're viewed as valuable products of the capitalist West, in contrast to the sort of presumptively propagandistic art coming out of the Soviet Union. So the CIA actually funded a lot of avant-garde literary magazines and yeah. visual art. Yeah. yeah, it's all over. It was a charm offensive of a sort. Yeah. Why are charm offensive? Even rehabilitated the reputations of people like Ezra Pound, who by the time he died in 1975 was seen as one of the great figures in American history, despite everything he had done. So, I, it's always going to kind of pull back a little bit in modernism because, as much as I'm in sympathy with their, with their high, uncompromising artistic ideals, that sort of thing has a meaning. So, that's all I have to say. I don't know if people have questions. There's a question out there. Yeah, you're presenting this panel on modernism in the science fiction convention. 
and I'm just kind of wondering about the connection. Do you have any response to James Gifford's book, A Modern Fantasy? I don't know it. What well, is it? Well, a couple years ago, he starts, um, he kind of starts from, he responds to a lot of the Marxist stuff in his first 90 pages. He talks about hope miracles and the importance of her song in Paris to Elliot in writing the waste line. And of course, she, I didn't even know she'd written modernist poetry or had been a figure in modernism. Um, but she, uh, and he's primarily a, a, a modernist poetry expert, I guess he teaches in British Columbia. Um, but he then goes on to talk not only about her widely known fantasy, um, uh, blanking on the title, um, but it was in the Valentine Fantasy series. Anyone a Hope Yearlies? I don't. At any rate, um, he then goes on tracing this alternative uh, uh, descent of fantasy through uh, modernist writers up to um, Delaney and um, uh, oh, to Morgan Peak as well, and up into uh, uh, Gaiman and um, contemporary fantasy. Yeah, there's certainly a thread that we could have followed with the kind of connections between high modernist literature and what we would view as kind of genre literature today. We didn't really touch on it. I was mostly focused on that your reality may vary the idea yeah. that, that you're going to decide to describe the world in a different way. But you're right that there are many ways in which these um, people touch on stuff. Samuel Delaney was, of course, right yeah. here, too, deeply involved in the history of the modernist tradition. You have odd little coincidences, too, like in New York City, when H.P. Lovecraft lived there, one of the people that he would hang out with was a poet, Hart Crane, yeah. who was uh, then publishing, I think, at the time he had a as well. I think if Lovecraft had known that Hart Crane was gay, yeah, he probably would have wanted to hang out with him. And he talks a lot about the connections between publishers and some of the modernist writers uh, of, of the 30s and, and 40s. Um, I was really surprised at it. Connections that were underlain by very small publishers. Yeah, it's. It be, I didn't talk about this at all, but yeah, the, one of the reasons that we, we could have done a whole panel on the trial of Ulysses and the obscenity, the obscenity trials for Ulysses. Oh, but yeah. One of the reasons that we have Ulysses published in the first place in the United States is because the new founder of Random House um, had just started his modern library launch. Or modern classics line. The idea was to uh, reprint out of copyright old classics along with works by new writers, and he thought that Ulysses would fit the bill, and they teamed up with the ACLU to deliberately provoke the trial to put uh, Ulysses on trial for obscenity, and was found to be not seen, and that changed first American law in the United States. So all those little publishing stories are very interesting to think of books as things that have to exist. I mean, I can go to any library or bookstore and buy a copy, of course, the artist is young, all those things. Difficult births. Mm -hmm. It took a while to this thing. It's great answer. Great answer. Can you just say the title of that work again? Oh, it was A Modernist Fantasy. Okay. And it's by like like James yeah. Gifford. Yeah, I have that ORD. Thank you. Uh, and it was um, published in 2019. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're a little over time, but do we have time for a final question if anybody has one? Thank you all for coming. If anybody wants to come back in a half an hour, we'll be reading some poetry and prose from this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.